Welcome to River Park Church. I'm glad to see you all here. We're going to start our service with a worship song, so if you would like to stand or if you're able, we will start in praise together. Welcome to River Park Church. I uh, welcome all of you here and also those of you who are joining us online. If you are a visitor, I want to extend a special welcome to you. I hope you enjoy this worship service with us today. Um, please be seated. We have several announcements this morning. You can follow along with our order of worship using papers available as you entered by scanning a QR code or by downloading our church app. And later in this service, uh, we will read um, New City Catechism number 35, and then children in kindergarten through grade six 
are invited to Sunday School or Jacob's Letter for age-appropriate lessons and activities. And today, all Sunday School, Jacob's Letter, and youth families are invited to a picnic after this service. It is from 12 to 3 p.m. at Edwards Park. If smoke is your concern, the broadcast says it is going to be better this afternoon. So um, if you have any questions, um, please contact Jamie Miller. She's over there. Yeah. And our designated offering this week is for Rehoboth Christian Ministries. This ministry is to help ensure the availability of funds for capital project, enhancement of programs, and acquiring vehicles that are not typically funded by the Ministry of Alberta Community and Social Services. It will be collected later during the service. Let's continue in worship together. Again, if you're able, please stand.
So we'll sing this song through one and a half-ish times. This is a little different than normal. And then after we sing, the children are dismissed. After the song, the children are dismissed. <laughs> to come with open minds and attitudes to seek your presence and your guidance, Lord. We especially pray for Pastor Adrian as he represents our church and our classes. Fill him with your supernatural peace and endurance. Feed his soul as he earnestly seeks to do your will there, Lord. Holy Spirit, come to this place as Pastor Harrison shares your word. Bless the message you have given him to share this week. Help our ears to hear clearly and our minds to be open to your guidance and message today. Father God, create in us a clean hearts. 
Show us where we must repent this week. Renew our spirits today as we worship you. Master of salvation, hear our prayer. Amen. We're going to have our morning offering in which you can come forward during the song. Um, and we do thank those who are continuing to give online as well. The, new, uh, or the next song is new. Um, some people might know it. Um, but I welcome you to use it as a time of reflection on our gratitude to God.
praise you again and again Cause all that I have is above Hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I have nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, On last Sunday, we began the new sermon series titled Growing in Relationship with God, following the Encountering God series that started on sun, uh, Easter Sunday. All of us have experienced a life-changing moment of encountering the living God for the first time at some point in our lives. Now, we are invited to live with Him, live for Him, and strive to become more like Him. We have a deep desire to cultivate a genuine relationship with Him and to experience the transformative power of His love. In our pursuit, we attend the worship services, participate in church ministries, study the Bible, and serve our neighbors. However, one of the questions I hope I often hear from people is, I feel like my spiritual journey is still skimming the surface, and my relationship with God is not growing as I have hoped. How about you? Reflect on your past and present relationship with God for a moment. Have you grown, stayed the same, or regressed? If you find yourself struggling in your spiritual growth, what might be missing? What could be hindering your growth in your relationship with God? There may be various reasons that hinder spiritual growth. But our focus this morning will be on the most significant and foundational ones. And the first step we need to take for our growth in relationship with God. Today's scripture passage is Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for my such a confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, 
I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained, not that I, I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenwards in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. In verse 1, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Paul encourages us to find true joy in our relationship with the Lord. When you cultivate a genuine and faithful connection with God, seeking His presence and guidance, and living out His words and love, it brings about deep and lasting joy, peace, and contentment. They are coming through true communion with the Lord. They arise from experiencing God's presence, love, and grace in the relationship with Him. Paul emphasized the importance of rejoicing in the Lord again because it helps to continue to live a godly life and to protect us from temptations, challenges, or difficulties that we may be facing in our everyday lives. It is possible only when our spirit is rooted in the firm foundation of faith in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are reconciled with God. This reconciliation allows us to have a deep and personal connection with God. This connection is not a mere relationship, but the intimate, transformative relationship that affects every area of our lives. This relationship extends beyond the personal connection with God. It includes relationships with fellow believers, neighbors, and even enemies. Through Jesus Christ, we are called to build meaningful and loving relationship with them. In other world, in other word, Christianity is all about our relationship with God and others. And God is central to our Christian life. He is the source and initiator of all relationships. So if you are not experiencing growth in your relationship with God, find yourself in a spiritual slump, or feel like you are gradually drifting away from God, it is important to begin by examining the foundation of your faith. I believe that 
you intentionally try to look to God as Christians. But you may often be you may often be turning toward other counterfeit gods who are placing your confidence in the wrong places. It happened among the early church community. Surprisingly, it is very common for many Christians today to be living this way. In verse 2, Paul warns the believers at Philippi about Judaizers. He uses three strong terms to describe three different groups of them, dogs, evildoers, and mutilators of the flesh. We don't need to go into details about each individual group. Generally speaking, they were groups of individuals in the early church era who believed that in order to be a Christian, one must also observe Jewish laws and rituals, including circumcision and dietary laws. They also thought that the sinner was saved by faith plus works, especially the works of the Jewish law. The first teachers had their own convictions or beliefs about salvation based on Jewish traditional understanding of salvation. They put confidence in their own convictions. They undermined the work of Christ or introduced additional requirements or works-based approaches. They had a harmful impact on the work of Christ as well as the spiritual, spiritual growth of the Christians and their church community. Paul strongly opposed their teachings, arguing that Faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice was sufficient for salvation. The conflict between Judaizers and those who followed Paul's teaching led to significant debates and controversies in the early church community. Eventually, the early church declared its position, affirming that Gentile believers did not need to conform to Jewish practices to become Christians. Even Paul, before his conversion, misplaced confidence in his own convictions and believed that he was doing God's will and imprisoned or killed followers of Christ. We also know that Pharisees and uh, religious leaders in Jesus' time challenged and judged the Lord with their strong confidence in their traditions and understanding of uh, salvation. We see and understand things from a limited human perspective through our own lens, shaped by, shaped by personal experiences. None of us possesses complete knowledge or wisdom. We only grasp a fraction of the truth. It is in this limited understanding that human desires or greed can lead Christians to create a wrong path of salvation, to satisfy their traditions or personal comfort like the Judaizer. They may even shape a God according to their self-centered nature, guided by their own limited understanding and conviction. They think this way. If he is the true God, then this person must be saved 
or that person must be punished. He must stop these bad things happening now. If God really cares about me, he should guide me this way. He should give me what I need at this point. He should give me a better job. He should help me avoid unnecessary troubles. He should resolve my life issues before too late. Or he should answer my prayers this way. The list is long. If they continue this way, in the end, they'll have their own idea about God. They eventually create a God in their own image as they desire and look to the God. They come to church to worship the God that they made in their mind rather than worshiping the true God who created them. They want God to act the way they think is right and only to be their personal helper or supporter, not their Lord. But the God they created will do nothing because that is simply another idol in their heart. When they pursue the wrong path, God's answers will be very different from their expectation. He will continue to stir their hearts, try to help them truly learn who He is and who they are, and guide them to the way that they are supposed to go. They will get so disappointed upset, and frustrated with God. They may be wondering about God and might walk away from Him. What God are you looking to? The true God who created you or a God that you created? In verses 4 to 6, Paul says, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul had a great uh, reputation as a scholar and a religious leader. He took pride in his Jewish heritage and his religious achievement, finding satisfaction in his achievement. He had many friends who admired his zeal and more moral character. All of these aspects held great value to him. And he had diligently pursued these treasures. But after he had encountered Jesus, he learned that these treasures were contrary to what Jesus Christ had to offer. And he came to the realization that everything he held dear was actually worthless compared to what he found in Christ. His own treasures brought personal glory, but they did not bring glory to God. Nor did they satisfy his deepest spiritual needs. Paul described them as nothing but garbage. What are your treasures? In other words, 
What are your idols? Anything or anyone you put above God or look to other than God is idol. It may be reputation, material possessions, power, success, achievement, or fame. You need to understand that there is nothing wrong with seeking a better job, better life, healing, protection, or a better living environment. They are not in themselves sinful. They are an important part of our life. And our Lord also has much interest in them because He always wants to bless us richly with the best. But the thing is, when you focus more on those things and put more trust in them for your sense of security, value, and identity rather than God, you may find yourself worshiping money, possessions, human networks, work, or family. As you use more time and energy for those things, they will become your idols and priorities. Then they will shape your values and thoughts. They will determine your life. In short, you will begin to stop looking to God depending more on idols and gradually drift away from God. You will feel discouraged and devastated. You might think that pursuing both God and idols could be practically beneficial and possible because it seems there was no problem when you did before. Suppose someone said to his or her spouse, I love you with all my heart, but I also want to live with another person for 50% of my time. Would that be okay with you? Of course not. It doesn't make any sense. We cannot say that the person truly loves his or her spouse. Their relationship cannot continue. We call it adultery. Pursuing both God and idols is spiritual adultery. The relationship with God won't be grown at all. As I mentioned at the beginning, many Christians are wondering why their relationship with God is not growing, even though they go to church, pray, or read the Bible. If you want to know your true priorities, you can simply check your calendar to see where you are spending your time and energy. It may show you an answer. We become more like what we pursue. And we become what we worship. That is why we should look only to God. And He should be the only one we worship. As I mentioned earlier, Christianity is all about loving relationships, loving the Lord, fellow believers, and neighbors, even enemies. If you are married, think about how you grow, how you grew in your relationship with your spouse. 
You need to meet, spend time together, learn about each other, do meaningful things together. When the person has become more important than you, and you want to serve the person for the rest of your life, you decided to get married. The journey toward marriage is full of learning and taking actions. If you simply observed or learned about your spouse from a distance without taking any actions, there would have been no chance for you to grow in relationship with your spouse. In verse 12, Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. The, the phrase, I press on, implies the idea of intense endeavor. A person does not become a winning athlete by merely listening to lectures, watching games, or studying the books. They become a winning athlete by practicing, getting into the game, and doing their best to win. Paul is not suggesting that we attain to heaven by our own effort. It doesn't mean we must do it all. However, it cannot also be a case where God must do it all and we do nothing. God must work in us if we are going to win the race. We are all called to continue to grow in our relationship with God and his people and to become more like Jesus individually and more like the heavenly church communally. God is central to our Christian life and the source and initiator of all relationships. Our holy journey requires the direct involvement of God and his people. We will experience growth in our relationship with God and our brothers and sisters only when we fix our eyes solely on Jesus and press on to embrace the calling for which God Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the center of our life and the source of all our relationships. Help us to know you more and grow in our relationship with you. Remove distractions and idols that hinder our pursuit of you. Strengthen us to press on, fixing our eyes solely on you. May we continue to walk faithfully with you toward your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. stand as we sing a song in response. Create in me a clean heart.
receive these blessings from the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. All God's people say,